Charisse is an associate professor of communications at the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications at Syracuse University. She holds BS degrees in brain and cognitive science and comparative media studies from MIT. Um, I, I, I'm assuming that you were one of the earliest majors, undergrad majors in CMS. Technically, my degree says humanities because CMS was not yet a labeled major. So I do have a mm -hmm. uh, bachelor's of science in humanities from MIT. It's a very proud piece of paper I keep on my wall. So you were ahead of your time. Uh, there was, I think, four of us who graduated in my semester, one of which is in our attendees. Um, but yeah, there's only, yeah, there's only four of us who graduated my semester. I think it became a named major two years, undergrad major two years later, so maybe 2005. Oh, wow, great. Well, um, so uh, then uh, Charisse went on um, to get a master's degree from the School of Cinematic Arts and a PhD in social psychology from um, the University of Southern California. Charisse's work focuses on how media affects the way we think about ourselves and others as well as how we use media to construct and reaffirm positive identities. Her most recent book, 20th Century Media and the American Psyche, about which she'll be speaking today, investigates changes to the communication environment over the past 150 years and how these rapid yet pervasive shifts have affected our psychology. At Syracuse University, uh, Charisse teaches classes on communication and diversity to professional media students, uh, specifically how to do media, um, how do media affect our understanding of different social categories and how do the social categories of media producers affect the media with which we all engage. She has mentored over 50 McNair scholars across disciplines at the University of Southern California, Loyola Marymount University and Syracuse University since 2008 and was awarded Teacher of the Year from the Newhouse graduating class in 2017. Um, so welcome, or welcome back. Thank you. It's very exciting to be here. I feel like my face is a little red, so maybe I'll pull that down a little bit. Um, yeah, no, I thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for continuing to do great work. And um, I'm sorry, I probably, ooh, that looks even worse. Um, yeah, I'm, I cannot express how excited I am to be invited um, to this colloquium um, and to talk to all of you today. I feel like even though my PhD is in psych, the um, role of comparative media studies and frankly, MIT in general um, really impacted the way I think about the world and the way I approach uh, questions just as a whole. And I feel really lucky to be able to impart this, um, these critical thinking skills to students across disciplines and uh, today to professional media students. Um, sh shall I begin? I'm sorry, I just kind of started diving into things. Okay, cool. Um, I will say that when I graduated from MIT in 2003, my, um, I really wanted to be the head of programming for MTV. Uh, that was my dream job. Um, I thought I could make MTV a better network um, by producing better programming and encouraging audiences to demand more. Um, I didn't even know how to apply to a job at MTV. I think I applied to a whole bunch of jobs when I graduated. I was completely lost. Um, and since then, like my overall goal in leaving or at that time, you know, 18 years ago, this dream can now draw, this dream can almost vote, um, was to make media better, to make, to improve the media environment. And I feel like I've really had that opportunity specifically with teaching critical thinking skills to media producers. So at Newhouse, students can't major in theory, they major in broadcast journalism, newspaper journalism, advertising, PR, television, radio, film, or like um, photography, uh, multimedia design. 
So um, by imparting these skills to people who are actually going out and making media and affecting the discourse, I feel like I'm really having a direct impact on um, the quality of media and fostering producers that can create content that is disruptive and encourages other people to think more deeply about uh, media and the world in which they live. So that's, I did, so that, that's, that's kind of, I don't know if that's an introduction, but it's a real context for uh, what I've been doing over the past um, 18 years. And for the, and I assume everyone took a read, took a scan, took a listen, that was thoroughly enjoyable. So how, out of curiosity, quick show of hands, how many of you listened to the thing? Okay, cool. And how many of you read it? Okay, a few other, few different ones. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I'm really curious as to the experiential difference in these spaces around, um, in this case, audio only media versus visual media. I feel like um, I make the argument in the so a third, second chapter, uh, second chapter, section one, on the role of uh, the power of audio to um, enact, enable, activate feelings of presence uh, and the way in which we have become so accustomed to having, for example, our favorite musician in our home, in our bed, in our shower, with us in the car, right? Singing just to us. Technically they're singing to a whole bunch of people, but they're singing just for us. And that, um, that personal intimacy that comes with uh, audio media is frankly 150 years old and yet it has become so normalized. So it was a delight to read that and create that content and thinking, well, this is, for everyone, but knowing that uh, people would be listening to it by themselves. So, um, you know, you spend so much time writing a book and putting all your words into happy little text, and then to suddenly hear yourself talk through it is, um, it, was, it was really striking and kind of an embodiment of the claims that I make in the book in the first place. Um, but I did get an email from a buddy of mine who was reading, he was like, reading this book is awesome. It feels like I'm in a conversation with you. And so, um, you know, being able to actually bring that to fruition through the power of recorded audio. Um, I talk about recorded music, but in the power of recorded audio um, was a delightful opportunity. So, um, well, what I had promised to you today in the talk was to kind of um, talk a little bit about the book, but also to um, chart this sort of cross methodological journey. And so I use the term cross methodological more than mixed methods, because traditionally speaking, when we say mixed methods, we're saying, you know, I'm doing a study here in this fashion, in this fashion, and in this fashion, uh, and combining uh, multiple methodologies uh, into one larger study. When I say cross methodology, I literally mean, well, what did we learn from this method? And how can we combine this method with this other method to get at um, a more nuanced explanation of some global or psychological or media phenomenon? Um, and I will say, you know, I feel like it's an absolute privilege to be able to do that, especially when we talk about academia that's so desperately siloed, right? That if your um, methods don't fit into the methods that have been done, that may work against you later. Um, so I, I put that out there that it's very much a privilege that I've had the opportunity to do this and I've had um, advisors, in, including Professor Ravel, I've had advisors um, who have been supportive considerate and always willing to remind me about what is gonna work and what's not gonna work despite what I want to do. Um, and so I'll, I'll just briefly talk about some of the research that I've done. And I've got some slides on um, the kind of my, my current stuff and it's kind of uh, cross methodological approaches. And then I could talk a little bit about what a media psychography is and um, the goals of the book itself. And then I'm happy and excited to talk about your research. Um, like I said, or um, like Professor Bald said, I am, I've mentored dozens of McNair scholars. McNair scholars, I don't know, if, does anybody know what a McNair scholar is? 
Okay, McNair. So McNair uh, is the Ronald E. McNair program. We don't have one at MIT, uh, which is fine. <laughs> It'll become ironic as soon as I tell you why. But Ronald E. McNair was um, a PhD graduate from MIT, uh, first black man in outer space. Um, it, it was not George Clinton or Sun Ra. Don't worry about it. those are jokes at the expense of Afrofuturism. Uh, so yeah, first black man in outer space and uh, he died on the Challenger. And so it's a federally funded program to encourage students of color, first gen college students, low income students to pursue PhDs and pursue research. So I've had the privilege of working with literally dozens of students who are not generationally familiar with the phenomenon of research, but are very excited about it. And what I've noticed in these conversations is this eagerness to answer questions that have come through their mind, come through their lives, come through their eyes um, in unique ways, but also a general frustration <laughs> with the structure of um, of what is traditional research, right? So I've spent a lot of time talking students through, you know, sociology students, history students, media students, psych students, business students, engineering students, through uh, ways in which to answer the questions that plague them in ways that will fit into simultaneously the expectations of academia and to fulfill their own, to seek out the answers that they find most fulfilling. Um, I will say, and I talk about this at the book, you know, like um, just those early observations that first time when I had a real epiphany about media biases, when I realized that little boys were always the ones who screamed, I won in game commercials. And it's funny because they always had these very diverse groups. Sure, whatever. <laughs> you know, they had racially diverse groups, they had gender diverse groups, they generally did not have ability diverse groups. So we can talk all about that and the levels of um, dimensions of diversity. But by 1990 standards, they had diverse groups. Um, but it was always the little boys who jumped up and said, I won. And I just, I noticed this, then I started tallying it, right? So I was doing little content analyses in my notebook next to my Lisa Frank hearts. You know? <laughs> and I was just so incredibly bothered by this. And I had teachers that I would go in and say, this is ridiculous. This is absurd. I'm certain I didn't use the word absurd in fifth grade, but, uh, and they're like, okay, you're absolutely right. Let's write a letter to Milton Bradley. Um, and, you know, just that moment of seeing this phenomenon in the world, documenting it, coming back to our uh, scientific method, uh, documenting it, observing it, and then starting to look for it in other pieces is such an essential piece of um, not just research, but surviving and moving through the world as a human that, um, you know, we can start to see how we all do it. And the question comes down to when is it fostered and when is it not? And as I said, um, coming to MIT, it was an absolute privilege to almost never hear somebody say, that's a stupid question. Um, and I'll say this, I heard that a lot, a lot growing up. Um, was that's a, that's a stupid question. Um, in fourth grade, we got to take chess and the teacher, re, teacher, um, uh, restricted me to three questions a day because I asked too many questions. So then I became like really paranoid about asking the wrong questions and being really conservative about which questions do I ask? Is this a good question? Is this a bad question? Um, in ninth grade, I apparently would ask questions for which the answer was on the board. And then the teacher started calling them Cherise questions in my math class. And then she told the next teacher so that when I went up to 10th grade, that teacher was already referring to unnecessary questions as Cherise questions. Um, and then, and so that just kind of kept going for a while because then I became that girl. Um, but when I got to MIT, nobody ever said that's a stupid question. And regardless of whether I was, that's not true. I definitely heard that from my classmates. <laughs> I've never had a professor say that's a stupid question. Um, and so this willingness to think differently and ask more questions and not be satisfied with the answers that you're getting, I think are so essential to, um, life. And then when we talk about media, as this is comparative media studies, um, the extent to which we've been asked not to question media is 
really striking, right? That, and as somebody who teaches media students now, media producers, asking why something is, is not necessarily a good use of time when you need to turn out an article in 24 hours. It's not a good use of time when you need to turn out a news package in 12 hours, right? Media moves so fast that we're not allowed to even stop and think more deeply about it. Um, and so that was part of what brought me to this exercise. Actually, before we get to that, going through um, MIT, I was uh, course seven, which is biology. Um, I wanted to be a geneticist. I went to all those nerd camps in college at like Brown and Columbia and did genetics. Um, and then I got to organic chemistry, which was 512. And it kicked my butt because organic chemistry is not chemistry, it's physics. And I suck at physics. So that happened. Um, I ended up dropping out of school because I was uh, in a not a good position for a wide variety of other reasons. I actually started college. I actually started MIT at 16. Um, wouldn't recommend it, um, <laughs> but um, not necessarily because 16 is inherently a bad number, but um, my mother was very protective. So when I went to college, it was like the first freedom I ever experienced. And it was, there was a lot there. <laughs> so anyway, I ended up dropping out of school without real direction and work suddenly becoming hard. And then I had this epiphany with which the whole book starts. And I went back and um, got degrees in, brain and cog and media studies. And for me, I was always asking questions across these two disciplines, um, you know, using brain and cog to think about media, using media to think about brain and cog. One of my favorite course nine papers I ever wrote was for animal sex behavior. And I don't even remember who taught the class. I should look that up. And I wrote a paper on the multiple mating habits of human beings and basically closed it with a critical, psychological investigation of pimpin culture, which was quite big at the time, you know, um, 50 Cent, PIMP, Jay-Z, all, it was really big in, um, in the pop culture and thinking through how women are framed as a commodity, um, both in the animal world, the bigger your harem, the, you know, more impressive male you are, and applying that to um, mediated culture. Uh, I got a C in that class, but it is still my favorite paper. Um, so then when I graduated from MIT, I tried to write a book called The Media Made Me Crazy. Um, and it was going to be a critical autobiography about how the media caused me such emotional strife. Um, I wrote up a proposal. I sent it to David Thorburn. David Thorburn responded and said it was the most naive thing he had ever read. Uh, I broke down in tears and <laughs> realized I need to learn how to write. So uh, I went and got a master's at USC in um, critical, uh, critical studies uh, in the School of Cinematic Arts and then a PhD in the social psych department. And again, I was privileged to have advisors. My advisor was um, Steve Reed and uh, Lynn Miller, who's in Annenberg at USC. Um, never tell me no. And um, even though Steve's area, Steve Reed's area was not media, he was constantly just saying, okay, if that's the question you wanna ask, this is how we will answer it from a psychological perspective. Uh, and that was, that kind of support is what I try to bring, um, not just to my students, but also to myself. So, this book now, The Psychology of 20th Century Media, or excuse me, 20th Century Media in the American Psyche, um, the goal is really to think about how these new communication capacities, the ability for us to be looking at each other in real time, miles apart, is remarkable. And frankly, there's been a lot of discussion about like how Zoom popped off out of nowhere. But now literally within a year since pandemic, and we can talk about how pandemic accelerated everything, Zoom is now a verb, right? It took Google at least 10 years to become a verb. Now it's, you know, we, we expect to Zoom. In fact, I think, no, it wasn't with, uh, first of all, I was calling somebody else. Um, and we had a Zoom meeting and I called him on his phone 
And he's like, oh, are we doing this on the phone? I'm like, yeah, I'm in the car. We're doing this on the phone. And like just the idea of going backwards in communication strategies was so foreign, right? We're always having meetings on the Zoom now. Um, I also like to say the before platforms. It makes me feel delightfully old, like the Facebook and the Twitter. Um, so really thinking through these technologies that have become so ingrained in our lives, the phone, uh, the ability to connect with loved ones and talk to them in real time across distance, again, is frankly only about less than 100 years old when we start to look at how quickly it was adopted and when it hit saturation and so on and so forth, is less than 100 years old. But it has become so normal to the point where my three-year-old is like, yeah, let's call so-and-so, right? And so I really wanted to think about this, this historiography or to do a historiography, um, and I, I'm probably using the term incorrectly, but I really like it, to do a historiography of how media has impacted our psychology over time, because psychologists, for the most part, are so distanced from history. They really like to say, you know, um, this is what we do. This is how we think, and kind of map that onto how we have always thought. But one of the arguments I make in the um, interview with Henry, I think that was also shared, is so much of psychology is based in people, like manipulations, psychological manipulations, are based in media usage. So reading a passage and then manipulating this passage to feature one name or another or a different argument, showing you a picture, right? All of that has become so normalized. But literally 150 years ago, literacy was way low, way down, and we didn't have photorealistic pictures. So everything that we measure in psychology is largely based in a world that we have forgot, is based in today, and we've kind of forgotten about what happened before the world we live in today existed. And so that was always very troubling to me. And especially as we talk about it with media, you know, that um, communication, specifically communication technologies, in this case, mass media for the most part, media that um, disseminate mass messages, are, um, they're so new. They're very new. When we talk about just a blink in the human eye in you know, human history, they're new. And yet they're so normal. And so it was a delight to sit down and kind of collate all of this research in a conversational way to think, you know, how do these technologies actually impact us and um, change how we engage with the world? And how have they done that so remarkably in such little time? So um, I'll just say, and, and then I can pause or stop. Um, I, I don't want, I, I want, to answer questions like I want to um, make myself available and hear about the work you guys are doing, um, y'all are doing. I read somewhere, I was like, oh, y'all is a much better term than you guys. Um, let's see here. Oh, oh, hold on, let's see. Sure. So um, as we think about this, I'll just hit a couple quick slides. Um, when we talk about a media psychography, I'm talking about the examination of how the collective psyche impacts and has been impacted by media psychologies, um, by media technologies. So literally looking to our own history with media. How did you come to understand yourself through the communication technologies that have become available to you over your lifetime? It's very easy for us to talk about how writing or reading impacted us, but we do often don't um, think about the other dimensions, uh, the other technological affordances. So by looking to our own histories with media rather than succumbing to the allure of newness, I think this is right out of the intro, we can further unpack relationships that users develop with media and provide insight into how people might build future mediated relationships. So this whole book also is um, rooted in a class that I teach called Psychology of Interactive Media. It asks students to, production students, to think upstream about why people use media so that we can anticipate what people might do downstream. Um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll close with, the, I'll stop talking with this one. I can also show you my um, lovely little, actually I got a couple, a couple more. Um, let's see. Um, I'll just, I'll come here. That, um, 
Yeah, I had a whole order and then I'm not using it, so I apologize. Um, I will say, so for those of you who read it, I didn't technically include the images or describe them, so that's on me. Um, but this is also basically my argumentation that we have a new technology that's developed. This technology enables novel strategies for communication, um, widespread adoption of the technology, then those novel communication strategies become social norms. Social norms change culture, customs, and institutions, and then we demand new communication strategies which relate to new technological development. Um, I will say as we think about, sorry, as we think about, and I'll close with this slide, um, as we think about, oh, this is terrible. All right, well, it's fine. Um, it's just very small, so I apologize. Um, as we think about the different ways um, media, can be conceptualized. Um, I, can, I argued for this fit taxonomy. I can, let me see if I can get a better picture. Uh, second here. Hmm. Okay, that's not working anymore. All right, no, okay. Um, let's see if I can get a better picture if I stop sharing. Yeah, that's it. It's just missing. Um, as we think about technologies, um, we can start to uh, break them down into different structures. So what I'm gonna do is actually, I'm just gonna zoom in here and then blow this up for you. I apologize again for not having a better image. Okay, so um, that we have a format, it's non-visual audio, static text, static images, synchronized video and interactive video, and whether that's delivered in analog electronic formats or digital formats. And then we get into industry and content journalism, advertising, entertainment, and peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, so we see in this graph, in this image, we see that the gray areas are basically areas where there is no research on the impact of race and gender um, in those dimensions, in those media platforms. Um, and so we start to see when we think about media differently where the questions have been answered and where they have not. And I think that that's a really important um, component for any media scholar to consider is what questions have been answered, but more importantly, which questions were we unable to even consider because we weren't thinking about media in this format. Um, so I can stop here. This probably seems like a good place to stop. I could also walk you through the outline of the book and the different claims that I make um, in uh, the three different sections, intimacy, regularity, and reciprocity. Uh, very briefly, I'll show you this, this happy little graph, which is what I presented at MIT 10 um, when Andrew and I met in 2019. But basically, I make the argument that um, intimate media like theatrical film, recorded music and consumer market cameras, as well as regular media, so media that is integrated into our daily lives, uh, like radio, network television, and cable television, and um, reciprocal media, so media that responds to our actions, like magnetic tape, video gaming, and dial-up ISPs, um, all impact 21st century media practices. And we can only see how they do that by spending more time with media that we effectively now call defunct. Ooh, let's stop with that. I like the word defunct. So I'll happily pause here, stop here, um, and invite questions, thoughts, hear a little bit about your research, um, uh, or we, I can keep talking. So I'll, I'll throw to uh, Professor Bald to, um, to, to moderate from here. Thanks for letting me tell my story, though. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to just ask, um, with regard to um, you know, in the introduction, you you talk about a, a, you know the this historical process of of um, you know of groups of people becoming accustomed to a particular particular forms of interaction around particular forms of media that then um, that then condition the way that we understand and use initially new forms of media um, 
and there's there's sort of a, a back and forth between um, what you're what you're t- describing as as new and what you're describing as as old, right? Um, that there's not a, um, a not a clear break, but this this kind of um, uh, ongoing process of or cycles of adaptation and change. Um, and so I I just wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about this, um, the tension between sameness and newness, right? That, that sort of appears in, in, um, in what you're describing. Um, and there's, there's sort of a, a follow-up question too about, um, uh, about s- generations, um, but, but we can get to that in a second. Okay, cool. Because I was about to start writing down your questions. Once you get into two parts, I'm like, oh, I got to write that one down. Um, So same, same, but different, I think is one of my favorite adages that um, somebody said. I think it was on, I think I was traveling with some Aussies and they kept saying same, same, but different. Um, No, I think it was Brits. Same, same, but different. Um, So I will say, and one of the points that I make is I only ever use new and old as relative terms, right? One media is newer in the grand timeline of things than some other medium. Um, I try not to categorize media as new, but at the same time, um, new technologies, rhetorically speaking, we use new technologies as an easier way to fulfill old habits, right? So Reeves and Nass say uh, new media engage with old brains, uh, that we use new media to fulfill old habits. So when the cell phone was the cell phone, it was a phone. And like, we got to use a phone wherever we wanted to use this phone. And then we learned that there was this thing called text messaging. And Americans were way late on that game, right? <laughs> because we were so consumed with using the phone as a phone. Um, and now we don't even use the phone as a phone anymore because uh, these, these other opportunities, email, social media, video games, all of those things um, become the dominant use of the computer in our pocket, even though we still technically call it a phone. So um, I think that to come back to what I was starting to write is the tension between the idea of sameness and different is that um, we, and this is the claim I make about it being in a relationship with media, we lead in every, in every new relationship, we expect to at the very least have all the good things that we had from the last relationship. And so that's, that's the baggage we bring to every new relationship. And I probably shouldn't use baggage (laughs) so flippantly, but you know, that's the baggage we bring to every new relationship is the joys and fears of our last relationship. And I argue that if we think about media technology in that relational lens, what is the baggage that we're bringing to every new relationship and how does that impede us frequently from being able to see the potential, everything in this new relationship that could happen when in reality, we're looking at this new relationship through the lens of our old relationships. And if we map that onto media, how are we looking at this new temporarily temporarily, right, time-wise, uh, new media, medium, through the baggage of our old mediums. And I think that that baggage of our old mediums is not just how we engage with the technology, but it becomes a way of understanding ourselves, right? There's what you bring to every new relationship is a residual from the old relationship, but it's a residual of the old relationship because it still resides within you. And so that's basically the argument that I'm trying to make that with every new technology, the only constant is us. And in that constant, but that constant itself has been evolving because we have all been moving through these technologies arguably together um, for, as I argue in this case, 150 years and earlier. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and it it kind of, it connects um, somewhat to the second part. which is that that um, you know also in the introduction you um, you sp- speak about you, you draw a distinction between different um, you know regions of the world, for example, um, uh, that are differently resourced, that have different a- modes of or, or amounts of access to different kinds of technologies, um, and you um, draw a distinction in terms of the being able to. 
um, sort of make make statements about the psychological um, relationship to media in one place based upon another, right? Mm -hmm. um, you sort of caution against that, right? Um, what what I was curious about in reading that and thinking about um, uh, the the like aspects of generational change is um, is that you know what you're describing in terms of um, you know bringing uh, the baggage of our past media use to each new medium. Um, of course, generationally, there will be you know, folks younger than us whose engagement with, with the new media is actually their originary engagement, right? Um, to, to the extent that um, in some ways you might argue that, that uh, generational differences might start to look more like the kinds of um, geographic distance, differences that, that you are um, are speaking about as well, and I was wondering, you know, about um, about that. Or you know, what can we say about, um, you know, is there a, a kind of essentially different psychological engagement with technology from one generation to another? Right? I mean, I would say yes. I will say um, I'll make a point that. I do caution against generalizing um, a small sample, right? Because I, I, ever since I read that weird article from Heinrich et al., Heinrich something in Norazian, um, I apologize for forgetting the second author, but um, that weird article about social science, and that is that social science researchers look at Western educated industrialized rich democratic nations and that and then they go and say oh this is generalizable to everybody like as somebody who has largely been outside of the intersectional space that is generalized and as somebody who has been taught to study those who are in that intersectional space I'm very salient um, it's very salient to me about what I should and should not be generalizing to, by which I mean to say I've definitely had reviewers ask me where my white control is, right? Why don't you have a white control when I'm doing research literally on Black and Latino uh, populations? Um, I've looked at my own data sets and just seen a dominance of white women in the case of psych research. Uh, that are at private institutions studying college, right? Like this sample is so narrow. So I'm just always very hesitant of saying that uh, this is generalizable to everyone. At the same time, the whole book is called The American Psyche, right? Um, having said that, I try to acknowledge my own generational situatedness, like in the very first paragraph, this is where I am. Um, and I tried not to include it just in the interest of you know, privacy, um, but I do talk about it in the third part with Henry about watching my own child um, engage. And like my husband and I, my husband is five years older than I am, right? My husband and I are sitting here just like watching him come up on the Alexa and be like, Alexa, I want this song. And Alexa just plays it. I will have you know that he has now discovered who let the dogs out. And so that is playing on loop in our house, which is not cool. And in case you don't know about it, that song is totally about sex and it makes me very uncomfortable, <laughs> but he loves it. And, you know, it's, it, it's just remarkable to watch his desires be met immediately. And us know that when we were his age, the only desire that could be met immediately was probably the book that was on the floor, right? But he, his infinite desires are met immediately and he will grow up with, and we're just trying to instill, you know, some level of delayed gratification in his life. <laughs> like just trying to run him through the marshmallow test every few days. But, um, because everything is so immediate to him, I can't even begin to think about what his generation will be like when it comes to this expectation of on-demand. Like we came into on-demand culture. We came to understand it as adults. We're like, oh, I can watch this now. Instead, this new generation is like, 
I should be able to watch this now. I am guaranteed to watch this now. How dare you not let me watch this now? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. Um, I do think that generational differences because of the speed at which things um, advance do have the power to become um, divisions on par with geographical distances and geographical distances seem to be collapsing, right? So our understanding of different groups of people and what we have known groups of people to be geographically disparate, for example. Um, what's his name? Is it Friedman who wrote The World is Flat, right? Um, that the geographical distances have fallen, have, have become less impactful, um, less impactful, still impactful, less impactful, um, whereas the generational differences become striking and it is left up to us, you know, a generation coming into content to move faster because the generation born into the content, right? What is it? Um, um, digital natives, is that the phrase they use? Um, uh, and that's got all sorts of problems onto itself, but let's keep going for now. Um, like their expectation of what is normal in the world is something that we have to learn to be normal. And I think that, um, I think that that difference has the power to have some really interesting and important intergenerational conversations and connections. It just doesn't seem as evident when you're, uh, you know, when you're child can do more on your iPad than you can. Okay. Um, well, let me, let me open things up um, to questions from our students or from, um, from our attendees via the Q&A. I'll also, while we're thinking about it, I'll just go ahead um, and just describe just give you a little bit of some of the research that I've done most recently, um, very briefly. So uh, my research interests fall across representation of groups in media content, using media to construct identity and disrupt discourse and testing the potential of technology. And these are some of the pubs um, and auto ethnographic textual analysis of all American girl, uh, qualitative analysis of Caribbean, uh, multiracial Caribbeans and how they use social media, um, satirical education or educational satire, learning and laughing on last week tonight. I'm actually working on a textbook right now on satire and diversity. So that's pretty interesting. Um, a content analysis of early youth created music videos on YouTube. Uh, avoidant engagement, which is a collection of quantitative studies arguing for a theoretical and practical model of interactivity and persuasion. So basically what happens when you can skip ads, it makes you like the platform more and hate the brand. Like the platform and hate the brand. And then uh, this is a fun little cross section when we look at it qualitative, quantitative or critical. So these are just some of the things I've been working on over the past couple of years um, and the diversity of um, research questions, but in the end, all of them are to get at the same question, which is um, <laughs> to talk about your slip of the tongue at the beginning, how do we media, right? How to media, how do we media? So um, I, I was still readable, awesome. I think that was my, uh, I'm sorry, I'm bad with chats. <laughs> I think that was my table from forever ago. Thank you, Andre. Um, Questions, thoughts, angry rejections of my theory. Uh, I want to go with Tomas. Can you pronounce your name for me? That's perfect, that's Tomas. Um, and yeah, the question was around that, about the pronunciation. Um, so, um, so something that we've been thinking about lately in, in the department, we have a small reading group that's concerned with Latin American uh, media studies, just reading media studies from Latin America and understanding how this tradition of media studies uh, kind of goes with uh, Latin American studies, with understanding cultural studies and that kind of stuff. And I, I understand that your work goes in these directions, right? You all address in terms of Latin, Latinx media and those things that I think in the last two years are uh, getting more and more attention. And I was wondering if you could give some insights on whether on where do you see that going? If you think there's, uh, how do you approach uh, um, understanding Latino audiences and, and maybe if we were thinking about 
uh, what advice you could give to students who are approaching these topics maybe? Sure, thank you. I will say that um, my expertise is in um, processes of subgroup media. So I will, I will outright say that my expertise is not in Latinx media. Um, uh, I do look at subgroups um, specific and how subgroups use media. So if we were talking about how uh, observations of Latinx people in the United States, I'm not going to talk about um, in Latin America because I, I will not be able, that's not my expertise. And I hope that my perspective and methodology inspire you to ask similar questions around different um, media practices. Um, I think a big piece of how we're talking about it, um, and I will also say, so I do have work on uh, multiracial Caribbeans, but my family is British Caribbean, I'm British Guyanese. Uh, so it's always funny because people are like, oh, you're from South America, so you must speak Spanish. I'm like, no, you don't, you've missed some points here. <laughs> that it's a much more complicated thing than you've come from this geographic region, therefore you must be this. Um, but, and I think that that sentiment is still very much, is um, in my observations, I think that sentiment is very much pervasive in new media discussions, new media as in digital, social media, user-generated content in these subgroups, any given subgroup, um, where they're demanding people to think differently about their existence. And that's uh, when we're talking about Latinx media in the United States, where many of these um, that have been marginalized for such a long time, um, the content that I'm observing is very much about pushing back on faulty understandings of a group. So um, I think that the question needs to be divided between what happens with Latinx media, where Latinx is a numerical minority, and I put air quotes around that and we can get into that and changing numbers and so on and so forth, um, but where it has been either a numerical minority or historically marginalized group, and how we see media being used to talk back to these norms, both for people who have internalized those norms, like remember, that stereotype you saw on television isn't you, um, and to people who are not part of this group, right? That there's a very complicated question there. Um, and I look forward to your work, if you're doing um, research on Latinx populations and Latinx media in Latin America, um, how those, vo what voices have not historically been heard and um, how, one of the papers that I have is on target versus total marketing and basically the oxymoron of the total market that inevitably we have this idea that we are all X, whatever X is, but at the same time, we're constantly pursuing this individuated conversation. So I, I look forward to hearing about um, how media technologies are used to tell which stories and which stories are getting more coverage. Um, in uh, in any given community and population. Does that answer your question? Is yeah, that yeah? And and just definitely some issues that we're we're speaking about. Um, it's a small group that with Tamara Freshes who's also here as a grad student, and Diego also. I all think is here too. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely talking about these issues about also what it means to be Latin American, Latinx, and what maybe the ideas of globalization or representation mean there. So definitely, thank you for the answer. Absolutely. And I would also always, always invite you that every theory that you read, regardless of who wrote it, ask yourself, what does this mean for our population? And what does this mean? Our population of interest, right? Our population of interest and our media, does it fit? Does it not fit? And if it doesn't fit, how does the theory need to evolve? And that is the voice that I'm very excited to hear from you. I'm going to turn on another light because I'm getting super dark in here. Thank you. Anybody else thoughts? Ooh, yes, Professor Bell. Hi, Cherise. Great talk. Hi. Thank you. Thank um, you. I'd like to hear more about your critical research on Romeo and Juliet. Could you share that with us? I would. Thank you. I research is a is a big word. <laughs> <laughs> um, it qualifies, but um, 
Bob Thompson and I have been running this podcast for three years now. We call it a pop trash podcast. It was fired because we were both Fast and Furious fans. And Fast and Furious had been largely discarded by the uh, by academics, right? And by people in the public anyway. They're like, oh, Fast and Furious, what are they on now? Like 23? You're like, no, they're on nine and it's coming out in May. Um, but uh, then we started thinking more deeply about conversations that were not happening um, because we had dismissed it as trash. Uh, so then we talked about Keanu Reeves. We did a whole case study on Ke a whole star study on Keanu Reeves. I watched like 30 plus Keanu Reeves films um, and really started to develop a theory of Keanu Reeves as a celebrity icon and the um, and, and what he was bringing to the role and how he reflected um, American and human uh, values, right? Very much a Richard Dyer um, star study, classic celebrity star study. So then we were stuck, we're like, well, what are we gonna do next? Well, we wanted to do something that was a bit more feminine because we had done Fast and Furious, very masculine. And we do talk about Keanu Reeves playing with gender roles, but it's still kind of masculine dominated. And so then that brought us to, um, we we're thinking about doing a star study of Madonna. Um, we were thinking about doing a uh, Old Testament new movie and just look at movies from the Old Testament. Um, I'm a big fan of the book of Esther, just on a personal note. Um, but then we went with Romeo and Juliet, specifically looking at the remakes of Romeo and Juliet, right? So Romeo and Juliet is, it's not pop trash, but it is kind of ultimately postmodern, right? We all know the Romeo and Juliet story, sometimes because we are required to read it in class, um, but it's become such a, um, almost cliche piece of culture that we can now play with it. And so we are looking at remakes of Romeo and Juliet, starting in West Side Story. So starting with West Side Story um, and looking at how the, um, how the choices of the writer and director, as well as the cultural time, right? What's happening in the culture at the time, infuse and change and reflect the story. Because Romeo and Juliet is such a, it's such a go-to that anybody can layer something onto it. So we start with Romeo and Juliet, we start with West Side Story, and then we do the Zeffirelli, right? So these two very early ones, um, Zeffirelli is very true to the narrative and is generally critically acclaimed. Then we jump ahead and do Tromeo and Juliet. I don't know if anybody is familiar with trauma films, but they are uh, Toxic Avenger. It's like gross out, B-movie, really inappropriate stuff like incest and mutilation and basically all the stuff that made Shakespeare great. Uh, that's the tagline of the film. But then thinking through how this kind of gross out punk culture of 1996, uh, directed by James Gunn, by the way, of Marvel fame, um, reflected the sort of punk grunge uh, DIY culture that was happening in media, specifically through um, phenomena like uh, video cameras, also MTV, and just you know seeing how this kind of um, Gen X uh, gross out version of Romeo and Juliet. Then we do, of course, the Baz Luhrmann. Uh, that's with, with Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes. That's, that's the one. Um, then we also look at some other films. We look at uh, Romeo Must Die, uh, which generally is considered pop trash. We look at um, uh, we did Shakespeare in Love, we did Romeo and Juliet, we did Private Romeo. So if you haven't seen Private Romeo, it's also an independent film, um, but it was shot basically, it was released three months before Don't Ask, Don't Tell is repealed. So it's shot in the midst of Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, and features two boys, two young men um, in a boys military academy falling in love while simultaneously performing the play. So at any given time, you're starting to see how the play itself is simultaneously um, work in the classroom and like trying to understand this language, um, but also very much intimate and lived through this young love. Um, so that was great. 
Um, we also watched David and Fatima, which I was very honored to be able to expose that to Bob for the first time. He never knew that film. And it's basically uh, Israeli Palestine, in, uh, um, Romeo and Juliet in Jerusalem, um, starring Martin Landau. It's Martin Landau's last film, along with Tony Curtis's last film. So it's it's really weird, but um, it's it's fascinating and just looking at how this story has been retold over and over and over again. Um, and I'm trying to remember who the the character from Gossip Girl. He's British and he plays like the evil one. I can't remember. Anyway, he plays Tybalt in the 2013 version. And in an interview, he said, the thing about Romeo and Juliet is that every generation deserves their own. Um, so when we take that language and start looking at how are we telling generational stories through this story that we all know. And it has been a joy and thank you for asking. Um, so, you know, like, comment, subscribe. You can find it at criticalandcurious.com. I'm about to release episode nine, which is Shakespeare in Love, and then episode 10, which is Romeo and Juliet. And then we close with the 2013 and uh, Romeo and Juliet in Harlem. If you haven't seen that one, that's the first one. It was, um, sold as, you know, advertised as the first all cast of color to do Romeo and Juliet. So, you know, they're all, they, who, who's doing a Romeo and Juliet remix? Anybody, everybody, please get to it. Give me more. Um, we have a, a question from the Q and A. Yes, a couple please. of them actually. Um, so this is from Hamid Reza Nasiri. Um, hello and thanks for the talk. In that chart that is also on page nine, where you consider the evolving interaction between top-down and bottom-up norm setting. Um, so for example, uh, Twitter first started to adopt hashtags in a systemat systematic way after Iran's 2009 protests, and then later in the protests in Arab countries. And that changed the structure as well as the use of Twitter and also the whole adoption of hashtag even in our everyday conversations. Mm -hmm. This kind of interaction is especially more powerful in the new interactive media as for example, the norms of filmmaking were mostly set by a few studios in a more top-down manner. As a result, the norms of filmmaking have also changed and evolved very slowly and actually mostly unchanged since then but the norms of new media and hence our communication is evolving faster due to this constant two-way interaction. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I completely agree. And again, I think the accelerated speed at which we see things change are, is essential. Like we have to acknowledge that what is current today will not be current tomorrow. And that, that level of evolution is not, um, it is is new. It's definitely new. Um, I will also say it's funny that you bring up film because one of the papers uh, that is it's in a book called Mediated Millennials and looking at how um, youth generated music videos and from 2007 to 2013 um, and looking at how in 2007, it was very much adopting uh, tropes from film and kids were just trying to like remake their favorite music videos. But then by 2013, we see this real emphasis on kind of individualized and selfie culture, which was not necessary, which then like wrapped into the music videos that were being made at the mainstream level. So to see, Things advance quickly because they can be shared, in my opinion, can be shared so quickly, right? So you have that back and forth. Um, and now you see that older mediums uh, desperate to survive are mining whatever the young people are doing in hopes that that will bring them into the theater. Um, I think it really comes down to um, institutionalization, right? Film was institutionalized before it was required to change. Uh, it had 30, 40 years before television came along and then television was like, we're taking this, good luck. And then film was forced to change as opposed to um, other technologies, as opposed to like Twitter and social media, um, 
their institutional power just comes from the number of users they have, in my opinion, um, you know, and the fact that they've got whatever hundreds of engineers that can turn around a new a new skin like every six months. Stop it, Facebook. Just stop it. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Kelly had their hand up for a while and so did Ambar. I believe I'm pronouncing those correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I was curious when you've been thinking about relationships with media, if you've thought about people's relationships with media that talk back like robots, like how do you think from a psychology perspective, people should be thinking about their relationships with like that level of interactive media? Sure, um, and I think it, before we even get to robots, we can talk about, um, we can, I guess Alexa is a robot. Um, we can talk about GPS, right? We can talk about um, reciprocal. And I would argue that those are very much reciprocal media. Um, I, I, I love talking about magnetic tape, right? Cause I push play and it goes, I push stop and stops. And like, that was, that was I argue unprecedented um, at a mass level. I think what's really similarly with video games, I think, um, you know, before we jump into, what was it? She, her, she, her? with Scarlett Johansson <laughs> um, or this Futurama episode where Fry falls in love with a robot. Um, I think we have to think about this nuanced expectation of communication and the fact that I say go and it goes. I want something and it gives it to me. Um, the fact that two things, you know, the fact that we can have our emotions immediately, our needs, not emotions, but our needs emotion, immediately gratified um, is something that we have to remember. Like we have to be conscious of it. Um, and so I'm not saying don't use robots. I'm saying that robots are not humans. Reeves and Nass would say we might forget. Um, and secondly, oh crap, did I lose it? I had such a good one. Um, oh, I do talk about, um, the availability paradox and this idea that when the world is at your fingertips, we don't pursue it, right? And I, I track this back to like cable news, right? Um, cable news channels are all within the same like 10 channel spectrum, right? Like if you go up two channels, you go from MSNBC to Fox News. Uh, so you can literally push a button and have a completely worldview, completely different worldview presented to you but we don't. And I have so many students that come into my office like, they don't, I don't know what this word means. I'm like, yo, you're literally sitting with your phone. All you have to do is say, Siri, define this word. And it will tell you this word. But instead we're like, oh, just, it's just too much stuff. It's just too much. So I would argue that A, we have to realize that that responsiveness is, is, is a privilege, right? As opposed to the norm, as opposed to the standard. Um, but at the same time, how are we using that responsiveness to improve our own lives or how are we becoming a little bit lazy um, by not utilizing the full potential, coming back to potential promise and practice, using the full potential of a given responsive technology. Um, and in the case of robots, I mean, do we have robots that aren't connected to the internet anymore? I mean, I assume so, but um, this, uh, yeah, the question comes down to what does the robot do? What does the robot do for you? And why is that robot in your life? And I would argue that that's the same question we need to ask for any technology. Is that, is that a good answer? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Amber. Yeah, thank you. Well, mine is a little, uh, like it's about my uh, thesis in my okay, research. Okay. So I don't know like if everybody will want to hear it, but here we go. Uh, so basically what I'm trying to do is like comparing the way people create their autobiographical narratives with autobiographical biographies generated by algorithms in social mm. media platforms. Oh yeah. So, so you, but the thing is like, I don't have a psychology background mm -hmm. and like I am trying to think about, like, you know, in psychology, it has been recognized that the formation of life narratives uh, plays a crucial role in the construction construction of personal identity, right? Mm -hmm. so I was like, just, I was wondering if you could give me like an insight where to look at, like I saw your, I watched your talk, like your TED talk, and you're like, mm -hmm. there's everyone, how to explore the self using like different media. 
Are you trying from? to see okay. how like algorithmic narrative no you're good you're good you're good keep going okay, okay okay how can like algorithmic narratives can be used as a tool for reflection rather than a way in which like machines and companies like limit our reflectivity so i think you could give me a good insight well i do discuss in chapter three on um consumer market cameras and basically how consumer market cameras allowed us to create our own autobiographical visual narratives easily right like i push a button and i have a picture of this moment and i can line them all up and create an autobiography um and so i do talk a little bit you'll, you'll like that chapter because it gives you a little bit about the psychology in how we construct memories through visual images um and i do explicitly talk about algorithmic um pushing of stuff right so i keep getting notes from like shutterfly oh this was your so what you did four years ago i'm like cool and i forward it to my friends and i keep going um or facebook will give you a whole pushing your memories back because we don't often stop to think about well let me rephrase that some study said we'll only ever look at 25 percent of the pictures that we ever took all right and so this is what i love about these algorithmic memories is that it's like oh you shared it well here look at it because you weren't going to go back and look at it so i do think that it meets a real psychological need where we get to see and remind ourselves of things that we had forgotten that we wanted to remember um so i do think that the book and specifically chapter three and I will say this, you know, the whole book has however many hundreds of citations. It is designed as a prior literature with respect to media, technology, and psychology for these nine technologies. And I think that you will appreciate and be able to use a lot of the references that are in uh, chapter three. And they'll take you, they'll help you down the right path um, and help you start all that psychology stuff that you need, I promise. Thank you. Of course. There's uh, so there's another question in the Q and A mm -hmm. um, from um, Corey Schweitzberg. Um, you argue in the chapter that we should avoid overly determinist understandings of how media technologies influence human behavior. For example, social media makes you depressed. Uh, considering how interdependent and convoluted psychosocial and technological effects are on people slash users. That said, Facebook's business model is to establish and strengthen uh, predictable, profitable, casual relationships between data targeted advertising and user spending. Uh, you use the social media platform to pursue psychosocial needs. Facebook collects your data, targets ads at you, hopefully influences your consumer behavior, and makes money, makes money if they succeed, incentivizing Facebook to optimize their social media experience to make you more useful as a data mine and ad consumer. How do you reconcile the general idea that technologies don't dictate behavior with the fact that the tech giant successfully measured by multi-billion dollar profits use AI scientists, data anal analysts, and UX researchers to deliberately influence user behavior? Okay, so uh, very quickly, two, I have three things I want to say. One, I don't think they determine behavior, they encourage behavior. And then when we feel good about it, it becomes a cycle unto itself, right? So they're encouraging this behavior, but at any given point, you could turn it off, right? We have that free will. You could delete Facebook and it keeps going, like it goes viral on Facebook to delete Facebook. <laughs> so, you know, it, but it encourages this behavior. And when that behavior feels good, then we engage in that behavior. So it is a cycle in which um, the platforms create one trigger and then that continues to spin on itself, like some kind of technological cotton candy um and, and and it's sweet i've already gotten lost in this metaphor i'm really hungry i miss it's dinner time um so i think it's not necessarily that the technology that when we look at it from an outside perspective it would appear that the technology is determining our behavior but when we're in it, we realize that we've only been pushed in one direction and we keep going in that direction because momentum. Um, and then until we see that we're being pushed in that direction, we cannot stop. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to mention regarding Keanu Reeves is, you know, as you talk about Facebook becoming a, a using human users as a mind, I'm automatically like thinking about those shots from the matrix where the humans become the battery for the robots, right? And until we realize that we're in this space, we cannot walk away from it. Um, and I would argue that uh, this is something I say over and over and over again. If social media is not meeting your needs, if a given platform is not meeting your needs, you gotta let it go. Right? <laughs> you gotta like this. You have to, and it's it's easier said than done. Um, I will say I. So when I. Um, when I, I had um, my child three years ago, I started a new Instagram page for him because I didn't want to be one of those people who's like, their baby just took over their social media feed. And that's not to crap on those people. I just didn't want to be that person. So I created a new um, profile for him and I post a picture every day. So like he's got his own page, it's private. We're not trying to make the baby go viral, right? It's private, it's only family and friends. Uh, so he has a very limited circle. And now I'm on that one all the time because all it is is family and like Smithsonian zoo pictures. Uh, and Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. And so regularly I get to the end of the internet. Like that's not a thing. You're never supposed to get to the end of the internet. That's the amazing situation of infinite scrolling. Um, but I get to the end of the internet all the time. And Instagram's like, you have nothing new to look at. I'm like, great, all right? So I would just encourage, you know, we have to be able to see how our behavior is being manipulated. It's been manipulated since, you know, newspapers, right? This sensationalism, yellow journalism, all of that stuff was trying to foster outrage and anger and policy change and popular change um, through encouraging it. Now it's much more interactive. It's almost infinite. You know, it's just accelerated. But those same, that same willingness we have and I feel like I'm using willingness wrong. So let me just finish this sentence. That same willingness or willing acquiescence, and I do talk about this, willing acquiescence. Uh, I tie back to the theatrical film. Like we willingly give over our consciousness to theatrical film. We sit in there, we turn off our phones, we separate ourselves from the outside world. And we say to the filmmaker, to the screen, show me what you want me to see. Is it surprising that we would do that for social media as well? That's it, I got deep, I got deep, but I feel like that's where I got to end. Like anything more is just, I'm only gonna be repeating myself. Um, well, actually I, I wanted to just follow up on that and, and, and I think it connects somewhat with the follow-up question that, that's in the Q and A. Um, and it is, you know, I, while I was reading, um, I was thinking about all of the the kind of um, public conversation about um, about the 2016 election and about just the the siloing of of different sectors of society through so, um, social media um, and um, I'm just curious to hear your your take on that kind of conversation about like whether, you know, it's in some ways it's um, similar to, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know if you remember the organization, the PMRC, is that was? Oh what was yeah, right? the Parent Music Resource Coalition. We watched right. that Zappa congressional hearing in class. Yes. So, um, you know, is this, is the conversation around um, uh, the, the kind of, very dangerous fracturing and polarization of society via social media. Um, uh, is it just a new version of the, the kind of conversations that were going on with the PMRC and others claiming that, um, that punk rock and, and heavy metal were creating violence in, in society um, or is there something, you know, that is due to the, the, the nature of these technologies, the speed, the, the scale that actually, um, where there are actual potentially very negative effects broadly in society? Well, just to let you know, you guys all know that uh, to harken back to the PMRC, Prince invented sex, 
You know that, that right? Like that, that's, that's what happened. And Tipper Gore was angry about it. Prince invented sex. Um, I think that, I, I, so I do make the argument about silos as it relates to cable, because usually when we're talking about these siloing and these echo chambers, we're comparing them to the three network system when it was ABC, CBS, and NBC providing all national content. So when we had three outlets, three television outlets, yeah, you, it was a consensus conversation, um, but we're not talking about, you know, the hundreds of partisan papers that were happening in 1700. And there's a great visualization. I'm happy to find it. I've got it in there in some of my class notes about the rise and fall of American newspapers. And you start to see like how many there were, just like everybody had a newspaper that was every partisan perspective that they wanted between 1700 and 1800. And then around 1800, they start to homogenize and like, well not homogenize, but you know, aggregate into your big papers. And then around like 2000, they just start to die off. Um, but it's a really beautiful visualization. And I think that what's lost in this dots is that each of those newspapers was a unique perspective and each of them were warring against another newspaper in a given area. So when we see the siloing of um, communities, and I was just participating in a Reddit science panel on social media, political ideology and identity, that we see this siloing rise and fall. Um, when is it gonna fall again? I don't know, I can't predict that. But I think it's important to realize that when we're talking about partisanship now, um, we're comparing it to television, we're comparing it to network television, we're not comparing it to cable television, which, you know, diversified the spectrum to the point where people could find whatever they wanted. Uh, we're not comparing it to partisan newspapers from the 18th century. Um, so I think that, that that historical lens is important that we consistently drift into our ideological echo chambers because it feels good. Um, one of the arguments I make, I was um, delivered the faculty address to my to the incoming class at Syracuse in 2017. I, I make this argument that we are not amoebas, but we will behave like one. So it, the mass will inevitably go in directions that make them feel better and away from things that don't make us feel better. But as humans, we have that ability. And I think someone here who is it, Victor ZT Zhang says, I'm not sure if we have free will, we're just pieces of a complex machine that seems Facebook and platforms have our behavior. All right. Uh, the problem is we can't let it go because of how it stimulates us, right? That we see um, we're moving in these fashions, but we need to be able to say stop. Um, and on that note, I will just use this to self-promote, not self-promote, but um, beg if anybody's interested. Uh, my students this year are interviewing people who are demographically different from them on four different categories about their American dreams. And then they're turning these 30 to 40 the 45 minute conversations into bite-sized media content. So by the end of this year, we'll have 175 American dreams that really only take one minute to consume. And it has been, the students have really enjoyed it because they're being paired with people that they um, would never engage with um, because, they, because they're demographically different, because we tend to homogenize into groups that are similar with us. But then in these conversations, they're realizing about how much similarity they have. So if anybody wants to participate, you can go to sharicelapree.me and fill out the form. I think it's right below the book promotion. <laughs> Just scroll down, it's like the second post or something. Um, and I would love to pair you with a student, a media student, a professional media student who would like to turn your autobiography, Amber, into, uh, into bite-sized media content. Um, I also was part of a conversation I was a consultant for BuzzFeed and Procter and Gamble doing this thing called Talk About Bias, where people were paired with strangers to talk about bias. And I think the potential versus the promise versus the practice of social media is one wherein the potential is we can engage with anyone around the world. The promise is we will be told that our needs will be met and the practices we engage with the people we want to, right? But I think we need to revisit that potential, but the potential itself is scary. And I will mention this briefly. My stepfather, when he got off Facebook, friended everyone, everyone. And he was like, I'm gonna talk to the world. And I know people here, here, and here, everyone. Felix, I'm sorry if you're watching, everyone. 
Then all of a sudden they start messaging me with their creepy messages. And they're like, I'm friends with your father. And I'm like, dude, stop. (laughs) Then he realized that it's a weird, weird, weird space. And now he's not on Facebook anymore. So I think, you know, we have to, we can use social media, as I say, as um, Victor mentioned in the chat, we can use social media for our own needs. And we have to remember that we can take control. And at the same time, if we need, like start a new Facebook, I have another Facebook for my cats that only has 10 friends. It's great. So, you know, like do with it what you want. Remember, you don't have to let Facebook or Twitter or whichever other algorithm based platform is satisfying um, to define your only usage. That was a long walk. I don't remember what the original question was. <laughs> right. Are there any, we're almost out of time, but I just want to just see if there are any other questions out there. Uh, I will say there's a couple in the chats. So I'll just hit those. Mm-hmm. Roya, apparently a distant relative of theirs, worked on Romeo and Juliet in Yiddish. That's cool. I will say one of our choices on the Romeo and Juliet one was only was American. So there are a lot that we did not get into. It had to be. So, you know, like there's literally 200 in our database um, globally. And so we just cut, had to start cutting things down. So we cut them down for uh, American productions or joint but they had to have American production. So I look forward to watching that one. Um, Amar Deep, again, correct me if I'm wrong. I come from a decade of an engineering background and media studies is a bit foreign yet fascinating. During your talk, you repeatedly thought, I repeatedly thought how I, my dad and my four-year-old interact with various media forms. Loved it, awesome, absolutely. And like, just had, my book is dedicated to Diane and Constantine. Diane is my mother and Constantine is my son. And the line I say is, um, who remind, who helped me see the past and the future. Uh, and I think that those intergenerational concepts are, intergenerational components are so important. Um, and uh, Anna was our last comment. I found it really interesting, the notion of the end of the internet. I'm an editor based in Mexico City and one of my collaborators suggests that the end or limits of the internet may be where there is no signal. For example, in indigenous communities, yeah, sure. Do you think critical thinking may be useful or which methodological tools to integrate them on the internet from an anti non post colonial perspective? Well, that is a conversation for a talk unto itself. And I hope uh, Professor Baldwin, you do, uh, you'll, you'll bring me in on that conversation as well. Um, you know, I just, I participatory media, also something I learned at MIT. We have to bring in the people who are using it to have these conversations. And so, you know, the only anti-colonialist perspective that involves a colonized group foregrounds and centers said colonized group uh, or previously colonized group, I should, I'll figure out that language later. We'll correct that in post. Um, And I think that so much coming back to some of our other points about, media companies mining us for data, there's something to be said, there's a dot to be connected with the way in which we have historically treated certain groups, mining them for their resources, mining them for their labor, mining them for their land and leaving them barren. Um, If we start thinking about this phenomenon across perspective, uh, across time, across groups, I think that we can begin to tackle the questions of today with a more nuanced approach. Ooh, that's good. Let's close there. <laughs> that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Cherise. Um, and um, oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, Andrew brought it. Okay, uh, let's yes. see. Let's, uh, Alexa, do you want to come upstairs and say hi to students? Alexa, announce. Do you want to come upstairs and say hi to students? Oh, Alexa's angry. Oh, uh, I would have to go get him. Do you, I mean, I'm happy to. If you have to go, you have to go. Um, but I'm I'm happy to collect him. Um, or I could just show you. Do I have my phone? Let's see here. Um, he's very sweet. Uh, let's see. Um, here he is. Go ahead, say. All right, hold on. I'm sorry. This is probably not a good use of our last minutes together, but. 
Um, he had a really good one the other day. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, he's, we're working on potty training and yeah. I don't think there's any technology that helps you with potty training. That's, that's what we've come. You know what works with potty training? M&Ms. That's pretty much it. It's like, if your diaper's dry, you get M&Ms. That's all. It's, we're very low tech. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much, Therese. Um, and um, look forward to reading the rest of your book. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. It was an honor to come home. <laughs>